I was a scheduled speaker up at Diablo Valley College, just up in Central California. I uh, showed up on time, and a group of students got together, uh, half a dozen, perhaps as many as ten, calling themselves blacks. A group of administrators got together, perhaps two of them, calling themselves blacks. A group of faculty members got together, one or two calling themselves blacks, and prevented me from speaking on the grounds that I was a Negro. <laughs> there is a profound difference between the two terms. Briefly, those who use and understand the term black, I mean those who actually understand the term, know that it means that you subscribe to a separate state ideology, which is the objective of the whole civil rights movement. The Negro, of course, that term has been downgated to mean something that's slave-like, uh, a person who accepts white supremacy and everything else, whereas the one calling themselves black are supposed to be stately and manly and noble warriors of some sort. Well, uh, I get my licks in, too. I was speaking up in Central Washington, and I was speaking before Black Students Union. As a matter of fact, I've spoken before an awful lot of Black Students Union. Uh, they thought I was easy picking. You know, someone to beat up on. Well, at this particular union, I was describing the uh, conspiracy of using Negroes and causing the riots. And uh, this one fellow got, of course, they all called themselves blacks, you know, these black student union guys. They, uh, you know, and I'm supposed to be a Negro. Well, one guy got up and he says, You said there's a conspiracy using Negroes. And I said, Why, surely. He said, Well, why is it then? with all the black intellectuals and the black lawyers and the black doctors and the black PhDs and the black educators and all of the black in intellectuals all around. Why is it that you, you're the only black? And then he stopped and said, you're not even a black, you're a Negro. And everybody laughed at me. Why is it that you, a Negro, you're the only one who can see this problem out of all these black intellectuals? So I said to him, well, I hate to tell you this, but I'm smarter than the rest of them. So I get my mix in on them too, you know, sometimes. Well, in order to understand the civil rights movement, we have to understand what it is. Let me say specifically that one lie has been put out consistently, and that lie is simply that the civil rights movement has been infiltrated by communists and, of course, socialists. Let me tell you right now that that is a lie. If you assume or if you believe the civil rights movement has been infiltrated by communists, you have just swallowed the Communist Party's line that the civil rights movement itself was a Negro movement. It is not a Negro movement. The civil rights movement itself, the whole thing was completely invented by communists for communist purposes, that is, communists and socialists. There's nothing at all to do with Negroes, except that Negroes happen to be the vehicle. And that I will demonstrate tonight. Of the organizations I named tonight, only one or two or so can claim to be Negro organizations, and even these organizations, as I named them, it'll turn out are not Negro organizations, not at all. Not interested in Negroes, not one bit. There are a great many organizations, like I said, as I name them off, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Now, in order to understand the civil rights movement, we have to understand what it is. Stated briefly, the civil rights movement is a an instrument of the communist conspiracy. It is exactly that. It was designed to use the Negro people and their honest grievances to condition the American people to accept socialism as the only solution to the race question. This is what the civil rights movement is all about. It is designed, I'll emphasize that again, it, is, it was a movement designed to use the Negro people and their honest grievances to condition in the Pavlovian, the psychological sense, to condition the American people to accept socialism as the only solution to the race question. Now, in order to understand how these guys operate or what the movement is, we first have to understand how the communists themselves operate. Let's take a look at communism itself. Now, the communists, that is the Soviets, have never conquered anybody by military might. Yet three-fourths of the Earth's population, that's three out of four people, live right now under communism. And an increasing number every day 
are under some form of socialist or communist domination. We are next on the list in their takeover, and if we go, the rest of the free world goes with us, and I mean goes in a hurry. England goes by telephone, France collapses the day before, uh, we need South Africa is a mopping up operation. As a matter of fact, they're heavily under the influence of the socialists right now. The rest of the free world will fall to communism in just a matter of days. Now, from my own studies, let me tell you specifically that we have between 20 and 36 months left before a takeover. You can believe either figure, but it is certainly not more than that. If the present trend continues, we will be living under socialism between 20 and 36 months from now, and communism follows socialism like night follows day. We are in trouble. I mean, in deep trouble. Now, to understand this particular problem, let's take a look at Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> the communists have never invaded anybody. That is, they've never talked to anybody by military might. Yet, three out of four people now live under communism. Well, in Czechoslovakia, you couldn't convince anybody that it was going to happen. In January 1948, the Czechoslovakian people could go where they wanted to go, have meetings just like we're having today, discuss what was going on, talk about the infiltration in government, talk about the, the possible solution to the problem. They could do anything they wanted to do, and you could not convince them that there was going to be a communist takeover. <coughs> Yet Czechoslovakia now lives under communism. The Czechoslovakians are in slavery just as surely as if the communists, if the Russians had invaded with a hundred divisions and a million tanks. Well, how do the communists operate? Obviously, they operate from within. They conquer nations from within. There are three basic methods that they use. They are using all three in this country. When we understand the methods that they use, we will understand exactly how the civil rights movement fits in. And believe me, it is an instrument of their policy. There are three basic methods. The first method they use is the one that they used in Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, the Communist Party was disguised as just another political party. The Communist Party is not a political party. It is not. As a matter of fact, recently announced figures indicated that the Communist Party had, around the world, 46 million members. 46 million. It is not a political party. But it was disguised in Czechoslovakia as just another political party. They had enough of themselves, their dupes, their stooges, their allies, their sympathizers, and weak need idealists, and just plain fools elected the government until February 1940 when they had a plurality in government. When that happened, they had a peaceful coup d'etat. Czechoslovakia was slipped behind the Iron Curtain in February 1948 and not a shot. And then, of course, they took those fools their dupes, their stooges, their allies, and their ideal about to shot them after the takeover. This is exactly the same technique they used in Russia when they took over Russia. Russia was taken over in 1917, that is, in, in March of 1917. The Tsar abdicated in March. <clears throat> We've all heard about a revolution in October. The Tsar abdicated in March. The man who took over was, of course, a socialist, this Kerensky, who just died. He taught for 30 years up at Stanford University, incidentally. He wondered what's wrong with Stanford. Well, they know. He just died here a couple of three weeks ago. Well, this Kerensky, the first thing he did was turn loose all the criminals. This is why they want to abolish the death penalty here, of course, because the criminals then be put in prison as political prisoners, and then when the socialists take over, they open up the prisons and let the criminals out to put you up the people. This is what Kerensky did. Joseph Stalin, of course, one of these political prisoners living in, in uh, Siberia, he was in exile. Well, when Kerensky got in, of course, that was a signal for the communists to come in. Leon Trotsky shipped out of New York City with the first government of Russia. And I mean with the first government. It was sent out of this country. Leon Trotsky and $20 million and 495 guys. That was the first government of Russia. Lenin was in Switzerland. He came in, of course, and then Stalin came out of Siberia. In October, the communists took over, of course. Communism follows socialism like night follows day. Well, that's the first method. That is, taking over from within, disguising the party as a political party, getting up themselves elected to office, changing the government to socialism, and then introducing the violence to bring about a communist dictatorship. This is the first method. The second method they use is the one you're most familiar with. This is the method they used in China, Cuba, Algeria, they're using it in Vietnam, and they use it in so many places that you ought to know what it is. 
It is simply dividing the people, fomenting a civil war in the country, and then calling that war a war of national liberation. In Algeria, you're familiar with that. Uh, it was the Muslims versus the Christians. It was the Jews versus the Gentiles. It was the settlers versus the natives. They had the population all split. They made a civil war, but they called it a war of national liberation. In Cuba, <clears throat> they split the peasants, the so-called peasants against the landlords. It was the, the city dwellers versus the corrupt government. They split that country, had them fight, and of course, this was a war of national liberation. But the one you're most familiar with, and the one which has the closest parallel to what they're doing here, is the one they used in China. In China, they used exactly the same technique. There, it was supposed to be the landless peasants against the landlords. And the slogan there was agrarian reform. And that slogan is an exact parallel, and I do mean an exact parallel, to the slogan of civil rights that they're using in this country to make trouble all across, all across it. Well, they will use a civil war in this country, which they call a war of national liberation, which they are now even calling that. As a matter of fact, uh, certain of these people calling themselves blacks are talking about a war of national liberation, a liberation movement, the black revolution. They know what they're doing. Well, they'll use that if they have to. But they only introduce this kind of war if they have to have it. But they may not need it in this country. Now, let me repeat that. They may not need it. And the reason they may not need it is because the measures that the government is supposed to take to curb this civil war, this incipient uh, war of national liberation, those measures are designed to install a police state in America. That is the establishment of a dictatorship. They may not have to have it, but they've got it ready in case they need it, and you better believe it. They've got the guys out there shooting each other right now. They're killing the Negroes in the South and in many places. As a matter of fact, if you want to check out a very shocking statistic, go to one of the large cities and check out over the past two or three years exactly how many Negro teenagers have been butchered to make the teenagers support this movement. That's what these gangs are all about. Anyway, that's the second method. That is this, this civil war, which they call a war of national liberation. That is what they call the civil rights movement. Now, for the third method, and to understand how they actually are operating here, they're using those two methods here, but there is a third method, which is much, much more important to them. Let me read here directly for an analysis of that, analysis of that from the Blue Book of the John Birch Society, and then I want to read a 10-step program, which was spelled out in this blue book in 1958, which was a communist program being implemented in and through our government. As I read this 10-step program, and you realize what's already taken place, ask yourself what you were doing in 1958 when this man here was trying to tell you what was going on. And I mean exactly that. But there is a third method, which is far more in accordance with Lenin's long-range strategy. It is one which they are clearly relying on most heavily. And this is taking us over by a process so gradual and insidious that Soviet rule is slipped over so far on the American people before they ever realize it's happening that they can no longer resist the communist conspiracy as free citizens but can resist the communist tyranny only by themselves becoming conspirators against established government. The process in that direction is going on right now, gradually but surely, and with ever increasing spread and speed. A part of that plan, of course, is to induce the gradual surrender of American sovereignty, piece by piece and step by step to various international organizations, of which the United Nations is the outstanding, but far from the only example, while the communists are simultaneously and equally gradually getting complete working control of such organizations. Both sets of steps, which were short and insidious at first, are now being steadily increased in both length and brazenness until one day we shall gradually realize that we are already just a part of a worldwide government ruled by the Kremlin with the police state features of that government rapidly closing in on us. Now, to digress here for a moment, let me say that if the Genocide Treaty is ratified, we will have surrendered our judicial system to the United Nations. You take a little bit of sovereignty, one bit at a time, and put it in the United Nations, the international organizations just a little bit at a time, our judicial system will be dependent on the U.N. We will no longer have any laws. None. I mean, none. 
This is an attempt on the part of this administration, the Nixon administration, to surrender to the United Nations our whole court system to some kind of world party ruled by communists. This genocide convention was held in 1948 with W.E.B. Du Bois and a bunch of communists over in Sweden drew that thing up. Anyway, to continue here, but another part of that plan is the conversion of the United States into a socialist nation, quite similar to Russia itself in its economy and political outlook, before police state enforcement is ever introduced. The best way to explain the aim here is simply to quote the directive under which some of the very largest American foundations have been secretly but visibly working for years. This directive is so to change the economic and political structure of the United States that it can be comfortably merged with Soviet Russia. That's the idea. To change our political structure a little bit at a time and to change our economic structure a little bit at a time until we have socialism here and then merge the United States with Soviet Russia. And of course, the mergers take place through the United Nations. Uh, as far as the police state enforcement is concerned, it's already been proposed by men in our government that a UN peacekeeping force be eventually stationed in America. And of course, no Americans would be in the peacekeeping force because, you know, that's nationalism. You have Mongolians and them potato-headed Russians, people out of the Congo, all kind of savages running around the streets here enforcing United Nations law in America. That's already been proposed by this administration. Well, now, that's their, that's their process to convert us into a socialist state. The civil rights movement is an instrument that they're using for that purpose, one of the instruments. They have many, many instruments. Now, here's a 10-step program which was outlined in 1958 by Robert Welch in the Blue Book of the John Birch Society. I'll take it directly from the Blue Book. As I read this 10-step program, again, I want you to think why it was that our national leaders called this man a fanatic, a right-wing extremist, uh, a Nazi, a fascist, a anti-Semite, a racist, you name it, if it had a bad smell, they called him. <laughs> and most Americans fell for the trick. Now, he was talking about Sputnik. They put up Sputnik, and then they introduced a huge program in our government by way of Sputnik. Now, this is before the program ever took place. This is in 1958, mind you. Now, here's what he said. We are talking at this point about the usefulness of Sputnik to the communist and the socialist allies through its impact on the psychology of the American people with regard to their domestic affairs. That is, the domestic conversion here. This, in my opinion, was the most important ultimate effect of Sputnik as planned by the Soviets and is now gradually being realized by them. Here are the communist aims for the United States to be achieved, they hope, through the leftward momentum of attitude induced by Sputnik and all of its auxiliary propaganda. One, <laughs> greatly expanded government spending for missiles, for so-called defense generally, for foreign aid, for every conceivable means of getting rid of ever larger sum of American money as wastefully as possible. Two, higher and then much higher taxes. Three, an increasingly unbalanced budget despite the higher taxes. Four, wild inflation of our currency leading rapidly towards its ultimate repudiation. Five, government controls of prices, wages, and material supposedly to combat inflation. Six, greatly increased socialistic controls over every operation of our economy and every activity of our daily lives. This is to be accompanied naturally and automatically by a correspondingly huge increase in the size of our bureaucracy and in both the cost and reach of our domestic government. Seven, far more centralization of power in Washington and the practical elimination of our state lines. There is a many faster to drive at work to have our state lines eventually mean no more within the nation than our county lines do now within the states. Eight, the steady advance of federal aid to and control over our educational system, leading to complete federalization of our public education. Nine, a constant hammering into the American consciousness of the horror of modern warfare, the beauties and the absolute necessity of peace, peace always on communist terms, of course, and ten, the consequent willingness of the American people to allow the steps of appeasement by our government, which amount to a piecemeal surrender of the rest of the free world, and of the United States itself to the Gremlin-ruled tyranny. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot draw a much more accurate
accurate picture of what is happening in and to our country today than that foreshadowing which was drawn 12 years ago. The actual use of ration cards and the formal price and wage controls have not yet been imposed upon us. They are being held up until the war becomes large enough to serve as an excuse. Both psychological and physical preparations have already been made, and it will not be long now before you will have the pleasure of begging some bureaucrat for coupons with which to buy gasoline for your car. As for the other steps, I think it's rather obvious uh, what they've done along these lines. Now, as far as the uh, school system is concerned, of course, this is what Karl Marx talked when the Communist Manifesto. And those of you who have friends in the post office, and those of you who don't, I urge you all to go down to the post office and ask the postmaster if he ever had ration cards that were distributed under Lyndon Johnson. I mean that. They were distributed under Lyndon Johnson. They're waiting just for the moment when they can precipitate a crisis and install those ration cards. Government control of food, of course, is the way they took Poland, the way they took China, same thing. And as far as the money is concerned, they've already printed that red and yellow and blue money. You'll turn in 10 green dollars for a red one and then 10 red ones for a yellow one and 10 yellow ones for a blue one. That was printed under Lyndon Johnson. We're in trouble. We're in deep trouble. Well, that's their process. That was described in 1958, and that's what Sputnik was all about, to pretend that they were going to protect the Americans from the Russians, you know. But at the same time, what they were doing here was converting the United States domestically into a socialist state. We're almost there. We don't want it, frankly. The civil rights movement is a movement designed by communists and socialists to use the Negro people and their honest grievances to condition the American people in the Pavlovian psychological sense, to condition the American people to accept socialism, which is what the communists call their systems, to accept socialism as the only solution to the race question. This is what it's about. Now, let's begin the civil rights movement in exactly the same way the socialists began it. Let's go back to the turn of the century, before the turn of the century, as a matter of fact. Let's go back to the time when segregation was a fact of life, social ostracism was a way of life, and the Jim Crow bars were growing up all across the country. At that time, the Negro had two directions he could go in. One, he could follow Booker T. Washington, who at that time was the unquestioned leader of the Negro people. Washington had a basically individualistic philosophy. He might have even been called a German philosopher. What he said simply was, get yourself a trade. Become a carpenter or a hard carrier or uh, a farmer, an inventor, whatever you had to become. And once you had something to offer in the marketplace, you wouldn't be excluded from the public place. He saw the exclusion as a deliberate plot. He knew exactly what it was. There were other people in this country, though, who didn't want the Negro to achieve anything they thought he should subordinate everything to this fight for so-called social equality. These people happened to be white. Practically all of them. As a matter of fact, for the purposes tonight, they were all white. Now, they, had, they belonged to an organization which later became known as the Intercollegiate Scholastic Society. This organization is the granddaddy of all of the organizations that I'll mention tonight. And all of the organizations I mentioned tonight, except the Communist Party USA, are tax-exempt foundations each and every one, all of them. These are some of the very large foundations, along with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment International Peace, the Carnegie Corporation. These foundations, all of them, are working for the conversion of the United States into a socialist nation. And when I name the foundations, you understand what that is. Now, these socialists did not believe in overthrowing governments. They believed in taking over government from within. Now, they had three methods of operating. They knew that for all intents and purposes, men in all countries are controlled by institutions in those countries. In all countries. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Is there a Mr. Richard Fry here? Is he here tonight? Mr. Richard Fry? Well, these socialists did not believe in overthrowing governments. They knew that for all intents and purposes, men in all countries are controlled by institutions in those countries. You are controlled by churches, by schools, by civic organizations, by social organizations, and by the lowest, I mean, by the smallest unit, of course, the family itself. The family is an institution. 
And they believed in taking over institutions. They had three methods of operating. One, if there was an institution in the country which they couldn't take over, they would destroy it and build their own institution on the ashes. Two, if there was an institution and they could take it over, they would simply pretend to be interested in the goals of that institution, infiltrate it, get themselves higher and higher, push themselves higher and higher into that organization, pull their buddies in and go higher and higher until they finally had control of it. And when they had control of it, of course, it, be, it would become an instrument of socialism. The third method, of course, was that if there was no institution or organization to suit their purpose, they would simply invent one. Now, for this discussion tonight, the first organization invented by these socialists, which is a part of the civil rights movement, of course, was invented in 1900. It was called the National Federation of Christian Churches. It was bankrolled by Andrew Carnegie, who himself was a very, very wealthy man. In 1905, they changed the name of this organization to the Federal Council of Churches. Some of you might remember that organization. It was a thoroughly communist organization. As a matter of fact, it had an extremely bad smell. So bad, in fact, because of the record during, before the war as pro-Soviet propagandists and during the war as just plain old agents of the communists. It was so bad that they had to change the name of it. In 1950, they changed the name to the name it's currently known by, the National Council of Churches. This is where it came from. This is the first organization. The function of the National Council of Churches was simply to impose a socialist church dictatorship on the churches and to convert the Protestant churches into an instrument working for socialism. They have already done that. The social gospel of Karl Marx is being preached in the pulpit each and every day from practically every church in this country. The second organization they formed, of course, was the one which drew in the Negroes directly. They searched the colleges for years trying to find some Negro who would lead the other Negroes in this fight for social equality. That's what they, the term they use. They found one. They found him at Harvard University. Uh, I don't know why it took them years to find one. If I were looking for a socialist to betray somebody, I'd go directly to Harvard. It's, there's a lot of them there. Well, they found one. This one they found, of course, was W.E.B. Du Bois. This is the same W.E.B. Du Bois who joined the Communist Party in 1961 after having worked for communism each and every day of his whole life. This is the same Du Bois after whom the communist, W.E.B. Du Bois, left the name on our campuses. This is the man they found. They convinced Du Bois that he should lead Negroes in this fight for social equality which, of course, is a euphemism for socialism. But to do so, Booker T. Washington would have to be destroyed because he was the leader of the Negro people. He was becoming very strong, as a matter of fact. To destroy Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois formed in 1904 a movement called the Niagara Movement. The function of the Niagara Movement was simply stated to destroy Booker T. Washington. That's all it was supposed to do. Once Washington was destroyed, these guys, these socialists, would then rebuild on the ashes, build their own organization, pretending to be working for Negroes. Du Bois was successful in what he did. It took him five years. And by 1909, the Negro people in this country were utterly without leaders. And I mean exactly that. And the socialists were ready to go into action. In 1909, they formed their first front, which they called a Negro front. They formed it and called it the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. That same year, they formed a second organization, which was called the National Urban League. The Urban League, of course, was designed to pick up the pieces of Booker T. Washington movement in case it had some merits to it. Everybody who previously backed Washington now, you see, we're going to dump the money in the Urban League, not knowing what it was. And the function of the NAACP was simply to use the Negro people and their honest grievances to condition the American people to accept socialism. Now, the whole banner of the NAACP crowd was going to be they were going to reform us into socialism. It was supposed to be a reform movement. They said, again, they said they were social reformers. Well, now, you can notice what happened right away. Those people who wanted to genuinely help Negroes and who had been helping Booker T. Washington now donated their money to these two so-called Negro organizations. There were no Negroes in the organizations. They were not. They are not. And they never will be Negro organizations. By the same token, they were not, are not, and never will be white organizations. They are two socialist organizations working for socialism. They're going to enslave us all.
black and white. Well, the people who wanted to help Negroes donated their money to these two organizations, and they were betrayed right away. But you notice something else that happened here. The very rich people, that is the Morgans, the Rockefellers, the Carnegie types, these people, the Schiffs, they were able to give money to these two organizations under the guise of helping Negroes. They knew that they were socialist organizations working for socialism. Now, the word for what they were doing was treason. The word for it is still treason. And someday you're going to have to learn to call it that. Because if these guys take over, you'll have to call it progress. And I mean that. You'll be in slavery and you'll call it progress. If you speak out, they'll kill you. Well, that was in 1909. Now, there was some danger that the American people might discover what they were doing. So in 1917, they formed themselves a legal fund. Now, the day I refer to here, of course, is the people or the organization known as the Intercollegiate Scholastic Society. Again, it is the granddaddy of all of them, like that cornucopia horn, everything flowed from that. Well, in 1917, they formed a legal fund for themselves to protect themselves. They called this legal fund the Civil Liberties Bureau. In 1918, they changed the name of this thing to the National Civil Liberties Bureau. Now, there was a revolution in Russia in 1917. I mentioned how the... the first government in Russia was installed out of the United States. That communism was imposed from the top down on the Russian people. Nobody wants communism. I mean it. Nobody. It's put in from the top down. Every country. From the top down. By men in the very high political, economic, and social circles, it's imposed on the downtrodden masses. Communism is not a rising of the masses. It's the exact opposite. It's a suppression of the masses. Well, the American people discovered what communism was. Communism was just the enslavement of people by government. It was a system where they were butchering people on a scale never before imagined. Well, now, the socialists had to do something about that. See, Trotsky and the boys were in that socialist movement in this country. They were all in it together. So the socialists had to disguise themselves as good guys and paint something else as bad guys. So in 19, 1919, they formed a front for themselves to represent the violence. This front they called the Communist Party USA, formed in 1919 by the very same people out of the very same organization which formed what's now the National Council of Churches, the NAACP, and the National Urban League. And to complete this part of the picture, in 1920, they changed the name of their legal fund to the name they currently, you currently know it by. They changed it from the National Civil Liberties Bureau to the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. This is where it came from. The function of the ACLU had many functions, but one of the functions was simply to socialize the law. A second function was to make it so that all lawyers had to support this socialization of the law, or you couldn't win the case if you didn't, if you didn't subscribe to socialism. A third function of that thing, of course, was to provide protection for the traitors. Let me read here how they were going to do it. This is from the director, the first director of that ACLU, Roger Baldwin. Here's what he told them to do. Quote, steer away from making it look like a socialist enterprise. We want to look patriotic in everything we do. We want to get a lot of flags, talk a lot about the Constitution, and what our forefathers wanted to make of this country, and to show that we are really the folks that really stand for the spirit of our institutions. Think about it. They're going to work for socialism, but they're going to shout, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press. That's right. And they're going to show that they're really the people who stand for the spirit of the institutions while they back us right into socialism. Well, that was in 1920. In 1920, this intercollegiate scholastic society changed its name to the name it is currently known by. It's still in existence, of course. The name is called, the name is the League for Industrial Democracy, headed by Michael Harrington. Industrial democracy is a euphemism for socialism. Now, I ask you a question. Does this sound like a Negro movement to you yet? The only reason they can claim it's a Negro movement is because they're going to use Negroes as a smokescreen for everything they do. And they did exactly that. In 1921, they formed at Harvard University. I guess they were getting wise to Harvard. They knew they had some fertile grounds there. In 1921, they formed at Harvard University a student branch of themselves. They called this student branch the Intercollegiate Liberal League. The initial of that organization are ILL, ill. I think they knew that there were going to be a lot of sick minds coming out of Harvard University. 
Anyway, in 1929, they changed the name of this organization to the Student League for Industrial Democracy. They organized on all of the campuses, of course. The function of that organization was simply to use the students, just simply stated, to use the students and to convert the colleges into an instrument working for socialism. This organization had the same name throughout the intervening years. It went through some changes, but it had basically the same name, was part of the same organization. Up until 1962, when Thomas Hayden changed the name to the name it is currently known by. Anybody want to take a guess at it? Student for a Democratic Society. Formed way back in 1921. Formed by the same people out of the same organization which formed the National Council of Churches, National Urban League, NAACP, the Communist Party USA, and the ACLU. This is a civil rights movement. You better believe it. Now what I'm describing here, of course, is what the Germans described, or what was described in Nazi Germany. The Germans were told one time that they were working on uh, baby carriages in a factory. So this guy's working on a spring, and this one's working on a, a long rod, and nobody knew what the total picture was. When they got that baby carriage assembled, of course, it turned out to be a machine gun. And the people who work on this civil rights program are all told that they're working for some sort of idealism. That is, in the ACLU, they're told most people don't know what it's about. Oh, you're working for the preserved institutions. Uh, or you're working for civil rights or something like this here. Working for true brotherhood or something. But in reality, each one of them is working for some little bit of socialism. Let me read here again from the Blue Book and what we have to realize. The first thing we must realize is that there is no easy formula possible, no brilliant scheme devisable for beating the communists. Communism is not like a poison to which you simply find the antidote. Its present power and extensiveness has not been created by some grand formula that swept the world, but by the sum total, by integration in the mathematical sense of an almost infinite number of details done well from the communist point of view. There has been brilliant control and central authority, excuse me, there has been brilliant control and coordination by central authority of the efforts of millions of men who have been brought by one means or another, to dedicate themselves, body and soul, to separate tiny pieces of the job. And I mean that, to separate tiny pieces. Lenin said it, communism must be built with non-communist hands. So you want guys to get in thinking they're working for one thing, when in reality they are building communism. They simply don't know what they're doing. Well, now, to continue this part of the story, Hungary was taken over at about the same time Russia was taken over. The guy who took it over was Bella Kuhn, of course. Bella Kuhn was the, was the most murderous regime that the world had ever known up to that time. Now, this Bella Kuhn had a, introduced terrorism in Hungary on a scale never before envisioned. Now, what they did, basically, was they had some trains, which they called murder trains. They would simply load the train with troops, drive into a village. The troops would get out and kill everybody. Very simple and go to the next village, get out and kill everybody. That's what they were doing. That's, what they, that's exactly what they were doing over there. The man who was leading that, who was uh, in charge of that butchery, was Joseph Pagani. Joseph Stalin sent this Joseph Pagani to this country in 1922 with an assignment. His assignment was simply to draw up a blueprint for using the Negro people as tenant fodder in a revolution. That's all it was. He did that. He was well qualified for the job. He was a butcher. He wrote this little book here called American Negro Problem. This is his thesis. Now, the thesis of this whole book, which is the backbone of what we now call the Civil Rights Movement, the thesis of this book is that the Negro is not a racial minority in America. That's the thesis. If he's not a racial minority, what is he? Well, you see, he's supposed to be a national minority. The Germans are a national minority. They come from Germany. The Italians are a national minority. They come from Italy. Same with the English, Irish, French, Japanese, Chinese. So the Negro is a national minority. Now, they wanted the revolution here. So, of course, they rejected Africa. Negro didn't come from Africa, you see. The idea is that the Negro in this country constitutes a colony living in the body of the United States. Let me read it here to you. The Black Belt of the South. That's where the plantation used to be. Most Negroes lived in the South at that time. The Black Belt of the South constitutes virtually a colony 
within the body of the United States of America. And then they describe his quarters in a press colony. Now, if you're a captive nation or a press colony, what must you do? You've got to liberate yourself. So Joseph Pagani grew up a plan for that. The slogan they're going to use is called the slogan of self-determination as they themselves defined it. Right here, the slogan of self-determination. Here's what it says. Quote, the, talk, the workers, Communist Party of America, put forward correctly as its central slogan, abolition of the whole system of race discrimination, full racial, social, and political equality for the Negro people. Let me emphasize that that is the central slogan of the Communist Party. Translated in the common terms, they're going to shout racial equality, social equality, and political equality. And they're going to hook in idealists to support it. This is the idea. Racial equality sounds good. You can get lots of people to support that. Social equality sounds good. You get lots of idealists to support that. Communism must be built with non-communist hands. And they're going to suck in the non-communists with this thing. Now, when Martin Luther King advanced this racial, social, and political equality, he didn't tell anybody that he was advancing the central slogan of the Communist Party. He didn't tell anybody. I'm sure he knew. I am certain that he knew. He was not a communist. Don't get me wrong. But so because I would call for this racial, social, and political equality, the press called it black power. It's not black power, it's red power. Right here, as they themselves defined it. Now let me clear up a few definitions for you. The communists use a word called peace. Harry Truman came back from overseas and he was shocked and he said, the communists don't mean the same thing by peace that we mean. Joseph Stalin said it. He said, peace means world communism, period. Peace to the communist is a situation where there is no resistance to communism. When Eugene McCarthy and George McGovern and those guys tell you they're working for peace, they certainly are. They're doing everything they can to break down all resistance in this country to communism. That's what they're doing. They are working for communism. They know exactly what they're doing. Peace to the communist is a situation where there is no resistance to communism. Now, they use a word called liberation. You and I think of liberation in terms of, let's say, Czechoslovakia or Poland or something like that. Those are captive people. We know it. Right? All right? Russia was liberated by Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin. That's what they say. Mao Zedong came to liberate the Chinese. Ben Dolo came to liberate the Algerians. Fidel Castro liberated the Cubans. Liberation to the communists means the imposing of a communist dictatorship on the so-called liberated people. And I mean exactly that. Just imposing a dictatorship on the people. Of course, they're calling for liberation here, you see. They use a word called freedom. I think it's quite clear that they, that behind the iron curtain and bamboo and whatever kind of curtain they got, they refer to those people as the free peoples of the world. By freedom, they mean slavery. That's all. And, of course, the communists themselves have no restrictions placed on what they do. They themselves are totally free to do whatever they want. Less than 2% of the people belong to the Communist Party in Russia. It's, it's fewer than that in China. And the rest of the people are in slavery in those countries. Nobody wants communism. Now, to continue here with this program they have going, remember, they're going to divide the people or play on an existing division and bring about this war of national liberation, which is called a civil rights movement. Now, here's what they call it. Quote, as the national liberation movement grows, the Negro proletariat will play an increasing role in it and will struggle for the hegemony over it. The thing was all white at first. It was all socialist, of course, but I emphasize the white as, as opposed to Negro. As it grows, it's gonna, they're going to turn it over or force the Negro into accepting it. It's going to become racist in nature. That's all it means. That's all. The comments are going to run it openly until they get enough Negroes sucked in there, and then they're going to turn it over to them. That's all they mean by that. Now, to continue here, to emphasize the, what they mean by these terms, they say it would be a major mistake to believe that there can be any other revolution in imperialist America in the country of the most powerful, most centralized, and concentrated industry than a proletarian revolution. In other words, they want a revolution to bring over, to overthrow the whole government, to enslave all of the American people, not part of them. And they're very realistic. They know that the Negroes, even if everybody got a gun and shot everybody they could, couldn't establish a dictatorship here. They're very practical people. So they call for a proletarian revolution. Now, the people calling themselves blacks, the ones who subscribe to this separate state stuff, are the ones who prevented me from speaking. A black is supposed to be a citizen of the Republic of New Africa. This is the separate state. They already have a constitution.
Constitution. They declared their independence of the United States. They declared war in the United States in 1967 in Detroit. They did. I'm supposed to be, of course, a traitor to the race. This is why I was prevented from, prevented from speaking by those administrators up at that college. They know exactly what they're doing. And that. A proletarian, the word actually means a child bearers. That's all. Of course, they regard everybody as child bearers, as cattle. But it has a more deep, a deeper meaning, which came from ancient Rome. In Rome, the patricians, of course, were the ruling class. And whenever a patrician fell, he fell right into the gutter. They fell morally. Not so much financially, but morally. They became degenerates. Now, these sons and daughters of the fallen patricians, of course, were called proletarians because they were in the gutter with the slime, with the, with the worst filth on earth. That word simply meant the mean, the vile, and the vulgar. That's all. Now, if you wonder why it is that Life Magazine and Time and Look and Newsweek and McCarthy and McGovern and all these CBS and NBC, if you wonder why they are glorifying the hippies and the hippies and all that scum in the streets, it's because they are creating a proletariat. They're creating a union of the mean, the vile, and the vulgar. That's all it is. And I emphasize that. It's the mean, the vile, and the vulgar. Well, this is the this is the program to use the Negroes. The idea, the basic idea here is that the Negroes are not a racial minority; they're a national minority. The movement itself is going to be disguised as an idealistic movement with moderate leaders and modest goals, and it's going to be gradually transformed into a violent movement by the resistance of an implacable white enemy. This is the idea behind the movement. Now, in 1935. Two communists, one Negro and one white, wrote this little book. This book is entitled The Negroes in a Soviet America. I emphasize the last word, America, a Soviet America. They want all of the United States. And Negroes are merely the vehicle for this particular part of their program. This book is divided into two parts. Now, remember I said that the, the, the Communist Party itself was formed in 1919 for purposes of deception. All right? Now, the socialists are supposed to reform us into socialism. They believe in taking over from within. So how do you differentiate between communists and socialists? Well, you have to have pretense. All right? So the communists pretend that the only way you can do it is by violence. This book is divided into two parts. The first half of the book tells why you can't reform America into socialism. You know, it's just dialectic, that's all says, well, you can't really reform them because, you know, you'll be betrayed and all that stuff, you know. Reform won't work. You have to have violence, a revolution. This is the second half of the book here. It's right in the middle, as a matter of fact. It's called The Negro and Revolution. And they spell out exactly what they're going to do. They say they're going to have two revolutions in one. One is going to be a revolution of the Negro people, as an oppressed nation, which is the headline here, the rebellion of an oppressed nation. This is by way of the civil rights movement, the war of national liberation. And the second one is going to be this proletarian revolution, that is, this revolution of the mean, the violent, the vulgar. Wonder what the hippies are out there for? You wonder how they got them out there? That's them. You better believe it. That's them. That's their movement. Well, this book has many interesting sections in here. And here, of course, is a combination of the two revolutions where they get, they get the so-called liberation movement among Negroes going, get this liberation movement amongst whites going, you know, all these hippies and yippies and SDSers, and then you bring those people together and have this grand finale, you dynamite buildings, shoot police and everything, and over to the government. It's laid out right here. It's their strategy. Well, in this book, there's a section which which calls, of course, for the establishment of the separate state, uh, the establishment of land banks in the South. It's very important because they're doing that right now. But the last section, then they say that the only way you can realize social equality in this section right here is with socialism. And the last sentence in the book tells the story of the whole movement. And I'll quote it. Quote, join the Communist Party. Help create the powerful great vanguard which is leading the masses toward socialism. Socialism. Socialism is what the communists call their system. Socialism. Now, the best way to understand it is to look at it from a point of view of a guy who's a victim of it. If one man controls the essential services of another, if he tells him where to live, what to do, when to get up, when to go to bed, when to marry, who to marry, whether to marry, 
how many kids to have, whether to have kids, when to eat, what to eat, how long to eat, how long to sleep, how many kids to have. If he has the power of life and death over another individual, that's called slavery. If the government does exactly the same thing, it's called socialism. Socialism is the enslavement of the people by the government. It's never been anything else, and it never will be anything else. It's what the communists call their system. That's all it is. The communists work for socialism, and the socialists work for socialism. They know exactly what it is. And a lot of fools work for socialism, thinking it's something else. Well, that was in 1935 when this second book was published, this little pamphlet here. It's the backbone of the thing. Now, this is what the generals follow. This is the total strategy. These are the tactics. They talk about agitation, and uh, they're going to create black studies in this book, incidentally. They're going to find heroes, uh, Denmark, Vesey, and Nat Turner, and the likes, you know. And you wonder why they're being glorified to glorify these so-called revolutionary heroes. This is the reason why. It's spelled out in this book right here, written in 1935. Well, the whole revolution was supposed to take place in the South, which is where most of the Negroes lived. This was supposed to be the oppressed colony. So in 1938, the Communist Party went to the South to prepare for this coming revolution. They formed a regional branch of themselves, which they called the Southern Conference on Human Welfare. Now, this organization, as I said, was just the regional branch of the Communist Party. It was exposed as being a thoroughly, totally communist organization. So they, just, they walked outside, of course. He raised the name off the door, changed the letterhead, and changed the name. They called themselves the Southern Conference Educational Fund. Now, some of you might be familiar with this organization because this is the one which trained Martin Luther King at the Islander Folk School at Mont Eagle, Tennessee. This is the organization, the regional branch of the Communist Party. This is the same organization, of course, which directs all, and I say all, of the so-called civil rights activities in the South. This is the organization which supplied the staff and formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It is now headed by, of course, Fred Shuttlesworth, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, this regional branch of the Communist Party. It, it, it controlled all, and I say all, I mean all, activities of these so-called civil writers in the South right now. Every organization. Well, in 1938, the Carnegie Corporation sent over to Sweden. The Carnegie Corporation, of course, working for socialism. They sent to Sweden, brought to this country a man whose name was Gunnar Myrtle. Myrtle was given an assignment. He was a Swedish socialist. He was given an assignment. His assignment was simply to take all of the writings by these socialists, written over the past 30 or 40 years, and communists, condense them down into one volume, and to sell this package of racial equality to the American people. That's all he was supposed to do. So, so they would think it was idealism. Myrtle published the book. He had the help of 60 scholars, socialist scholars. He published the book in 1942. He called the book An American Dilemma. This is the book that was used by Earl Warren and the Supreme Court in 1954 to launch the desegregation decision, that decision there. This was the book. That was the first decision in the whole history of English jurisprudence that was not based on law. That book was based, that, that decision was based on that book. That book accomplished the long-range goal of the ACLU. It socialized the law. It also launched this whole war of national liberation, communism, and civil rights movement. This is where they kicked the doors open. Got to fight for integration first, and then gradually changed that. This was the plot. Well, when Robert Welch, in 1960 or so, put out an impeach Earl Warren sign and told the American people to impeach Earl Warren, he was trying to tell you, take a look at what that court is doing. They're stripping away our laws. They're converting our country into a socialist state. They're wrecking the place. But the American people wouldn't listen. Well, one day you're going to wish you had this. And I mean that. If we don't stop this, then you're going to be in a concentration camp, and you're not going to know how you got there. And I mean within five years. I mean exactly that. Well, now, that was in 1942 when Myrtle published the book. Now, to get this agitation going for racial equality, the communists and socialists got together and formed an organization designed to rally the Negroes and get them in the street under this banner of racial equality. They formed this organization in 1942. They called it the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. The head of that thing, James Farmer, 
and the second guy, Bayard Rustin, of course, you're familiar with. James Farmer is now the Undersecretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, which shows that the socialists rise high in government. I mean, high. Felix Frankfurter, of course, was one of the more revolting characters in that ACLU at its founding and all. But we'll get a little more about that thing later. It's a very treacherous thing here. Well, the second man in that Congress of Racial Equality was Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin is the man who organized the March on Washington. He is known as Mr. March. He's the guy who organized it. Not Martin Luther King. Bayard Rustin did it. Bayard Rustin is also one of the most notorious sex perverts in the country. And to show you how high these guys rise in office, Bayard Rustin is now on the board of trustees at Notre Dame University. Put there by Father Hesburgh, of course, who also is a civil writer. I feel sorry for the Irish up there. Well, that was the, that was core. Does it sound like a Negro movement to you yet? It's supposed to be a Negro movement, you understand? You know, race. Anybody opposed to it is anti-Negro. Racist. Understand? That's the key word here. Well, now, the socialists and communists also had a plan to convert the Congress itself, because the Congress is an institution. They already controlled the executive branch. Franklin Roosevelt was totally under the control of communists. I mean that. Just totally. They, they had their minions. They already got control of the Supreme Court now. But they made plans to control the Congress itself. Now, mind you, the idea here was to take over more them to get themselves higher and higher and higher in government, and then to have the socialism come from government. Socialism is the enslavement of the people by government. By government. So, of course, if you can get in there and do it from the inside, you're in good shape. Well, they formed in 1940 an organization called the Union for Democratic Action. Again, I think the function of it was simply to convert the Congress, to get themselves elected higher and higher in government, and convert the Congress itself into an instrument working for socialism. Well, this was a thoroughly communist organization. It was exposed as being that. So they walked outside, of course, for the presto change. They walked outside, raised name off the door, called the delegates back, and renamed themselves. Anybody guess what the name is? Yeah, the American for Democratic Action, the ADA. Now, in case you never heard the ADA, let me read off some of the men they were able to funnel up into the Congress there. The guys were working for socialism. The ADA is nothing but a regional, nothing but an arm of the Communist Party. Let me read it to you. In the Congress, they had Paul Douglas, Frank Graham, Herbert Lehman. Lehman, where we, you remember, was the guy. Lehman and uh, Abel Harriman are the two men who took all the food that we sent to Poland and gave it to the Communists. And the Communists used that food to starve the Poles and make them support communism. That's how communism got in Poland. Herbert Lehman, Will Rogers Jr., Abraham Ribicoff, William Proxmire, Pat McNamara, Estes T. Farfa, Don Edwards, Joseph S. Clark, Francis Myers, Matthew Neely, James Murray, Hubert Humphrey, Marty Neuenberger, Harrison Williams, Jeffrey Cohelan, Charles Howell, Richard Bowen, Foster Fakulo, Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr., James Roosevelt, Jonathan Bingham, and Chester Bowles. In the executive branch, the ADA has had G. Menon Williams, Wilbur J. Cohen, Archibald Cox, Thomas K. Finletter, Carl Rowan, Henry Fowler, Orville Freeman, Theodore Sorensen, Robert Weaver, Arthur Goldberg. Didn't you catch on to what's going on? They know exactly what they're doing. Well, they were working for the Democratic Party with the ADA. As a matter of fact, one of the charter members of that ADA was your governor, Ronald Reagan. He's a governor. I don't think we're supporting any political figures here were not. We'll have to chip fall where they may. Now, the guy knows what's going on. He claims to have broken with the ADA. But he's not telling the American people that the ADA is nothing more than an arm of the Communist Party, which is exactly what it is. It's an instrument for him. Well, anyway, the man who chaired that meeting at the founding of the ADA was Louis Farina, F-R-A-I-N-A. -A. By coincidence, this is exactly the same man who chaired the meeting at the founding of the Communist Party in 1919. The same man. Somebody knows what's going on. We're being played for suckers. Communism can only thrive in ignorance, and I mean that. Only when you don't know what's going on. Nobody wants communism. Nobody. Let me read here again what communism is, because 
we understand what it is, we might get a chance to propose it. The West, gentlemen, is suffering under many delusions. One is that our enemy is an ideology. It is not. Communism is not a political party, nor a military organization, nor an ideological crusade, nor a rebirth of Russian imperialist ambition. So it comprises and uses all of these parts and pretenses. Communism, in its unmistakable present reality, is wholly a conspiracy, a gigantic conspiracy to enslave mankind, an increasingly successful conspiracy controlled by determined, cunning, and utterly ruthless gangsters willing to use any means to achieve its end. One means, of course, is to make socialism sound appealing, and above all, to make it seem inevitable. They're doing exactly that. See, these Humphreys call themselves a socialist. Martin Luther King called himself a socialist. Just one method. Now, in, 19, in the 1950s, 1950 or 52, I've forgotten the date now, the communists and socialists got together and formed a second organization to work through the, through the Republican Party. This second organization had some interlocking, interlocking directors, of course. They were going to control both sides. The ADA was in the Democratic Party, of course. Now, this second organization was called Republican Advance. You remember this organization. It is currently called the Ripon Society. It's got the likes of Nelson Rockefeller and John Lindsay and this Charles Grodell and, and uh, Charles Percy and these so-called super liberals, all of whom, of course, are civil writers in this organization. But the point I want to make about this organization is simply that the pusher, one of the prime movers of the organization, was your president, Richard Nixon, he was, when he was back in 1950. Which is to say simply that I don't know what the motivation is, but many of our men in government owe their position to the fact that they are participants in this conspiracy, whether that participation is by omission, simply by telling the American people nothing, or by commission, that is going out there doing the dirty work for them. Communism, as Lenin said, must be built with non-communist hands. And it is being built with non-communist hands. People who are carrying out little weeks pieces of the job under the banner of idealism. So they get hooked on that sort of stuff. Well, that was in 1950 or 52. I have to get the dates because I've been forgetting it lately. Now, we got the movement put together. That, basically, is the civil rights movement. Those are the organizations involved. Now, let's kick it off the way they kicked it off. In 1954, the Supreme Court issued that desegregation decision. I've already commented on that and they were ready to get the ball rolling. In 1955, Rosa Parks, who was trained along with Martin Luther King at the Holland the Post School, was asked to give up her seat on a bus to a white man. She was sitting down, and the white man got on, and she was supposed to give him her seat. It shouldn't have happened. I don't know whether the man himself was trained by the communists, but I do know these things were happening in the South. I always tell people, I was down there one time. I uh, was in Mississippi in 1950. I was in the Air Force. I caught a bus to ride up to Pittsburgh, and uh, they had a purple curtain on the bus. They did. And the way they worked at it, you know, all the white people get on first. And then when all the seats were full, you know, they filled up from the front, you see. And if there any seats left, they came put a black curtain. There was a purple curtain across the aisle, and then the Negro sat behind the curtain. I know, I did it. Well, all I want to say to you is it's hot behind that curtain. And uh, on the lighter side here, we take over. We're going to let you ride on the back of the bus. Well, these things were happening in the, in the country, you see. But the whole idea here is to use the Negro people and their honest grievances to condition the American people to accept socialism. This is the idea, the whole thing. Not interested in Negroes, not interested in white people, only to use them as a vehicle. That's the idea. Well, now, once Rosa Parks got going, the Montgomery bus boycott started, of course, and this catapulted Martin Luther King into fame. He formed the Montgomery Improvement Association, and then you had the marches and demonstrations and stuff. Well, in 1960, well, or 59 or so, of course, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was formed, again, formed out of the regional branch of the Communist Party itself, staffed by it, and it's a staff organization. It supplies the staff to the other organizations. That's all it is. Well, to get the movement rolling here, in 1960, the sit-in demonstrations began. 
In the fall of 1960, Martin Luther King organized the activist arm of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This activist arm was called SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And its job, of course, was just to coordinate the activities of students. That's all. Well, SNCC produced Sophie Carmichael, Julian Bond, and who's the other guy? James Foreman, and a lot of other guys, as a matter of fact. Well, now, in 1963, the terrorist arm, the political terrorist arm, and it, I mean the terrorist arm, of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was formed. Now, nobody wants communism, and Negroes aren't part of this civil rights movement or this so-called war of national liberation. There is no desire, there never was any desire on the part of Negroes to be a separate state. So they have to be terrorized into supporting it. This is what Bembella did in Algeria. This is what Castro did in Cuba. This is what Ho Chi Minh did. This is what Mao Tse Tung did. This is their technique. So the Negroes have to be terrorized into supporting this thing. In 1963, the terrorist arm of Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference was formed. It was formed in Lowndes County, Alabama. It was called the Lowndes County, Alabama Freedom Democrats. A second organization was formed in Mississippi called the Mississippi Freedom Democrats. Now, in 1964, the Democratic Convention was disrupted by these people. You remember that? A uh, big demonstration there, you know, the Freedom Democrats. Well, you may not remember it too well. I hope I urge you all to go back and sort of look it up. But you remember that the Democratic Convention, they had a great big flag marching, marching up and down the aisle. On the bottom of the flag, there was a thing which said, move on over or we'll move on over you. So what you remember about the flag mostly is that to symbolize what they were, they had a great big black panther on the flag. The black panthers are the terrorist arm of Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Now, for purposes of deception, and I mean purely for purposes of deception, three years later, and 2,000 miles away in Oakland, California, Huey Newton and Bobby Steele formed what is known as the Black Panther Party. Our attention was drawn to California when they invaded the state building. Everybody said, who are these new guys? And of course, the press said, it's the Black Panther Party. Yeah, it's to draw our attention away from what's taking place in the South. I say purely for purposes of deception. I mean exactly that. Just deception. Communism is imposed by deception, trickery, lies, deceit, terrorism, and everything else. It's a conspiracy. Well, this basically is the way the civil rights movement is going, was going in the South, and they are right now terrorizing the Negroes into supporting that. As a matter of fact, I have some articles on that, how they... You remember, those of you who have seen the film Anarchy USA, you remember there was a Negro in the film named Terry Small, who was, I think, maybe 90 years old or so. He spoke out against what Martin Luther King was doing in the South. He knew what it was. You know what they did to him? A guy come in and hit him on the head and cut his tongue out. I mean that. Cut the old man's tongue out. He died, of course, for speaking out against the king. It doesn't take too many throat cuttings or cutting out too many tongues there to start up the opposition. And that's exactly what they did. Those of you who see the film Anarchy USA will see that in the film, as a matter of fact. Very small and how they, how they did that. Seventeen year old boy did that, of course. He was up on idealism. Well, now, to get to the other part of the movement here, to understand how it worked, remember the idea was to condition, use the Negro people to condition in the Pavlovian sense, to condition the American people to accept socialism. And the way to do it, of course, is, is to introduce changes in our economic structure and changes in our political structure, which gradually transform us into socialism. Martin Luther King described the technique to be used. He, of course, it was called nonviolence. He described it April 3rd, 1965. I have his words right here. Nonviolence is not the absence of violence. It is not what you and I think it is. Nonviolence is a technique used to ram socialist legislation down the throats of the American people by using the Negro people to create crises. Here's what King said it was. One, nonviolent demonstrators go through the streets to exercise their constitutional rights. Simply means you have a demonstration in the name of civil rights. Of course, the guys who are demonstrating are CORE, SNCC, and SCLC, and NAACP, and, you know, anybody else they can draw out their idealists. That was the first step. Now you keep demonstrating, and you keep demonstrating, and you keep demonstrating, you keep escalating that thing until you're ready for step number two. You demonstrate night after night after night. It goes on for weeks on end. 
and then step number two comes in. Number two, racist resist by unleashing violence against them. In other words, when you create enough tension, enough anxiety, you can get violence. Now, the violence may come by way of arrest. It may come by way of some clansman throwing rocks at them. It may come by way of somebody getting upset there just starting a fight. But you had to have the violence in order to go to step three and step four. They wanted the violence. Violence was the core of the nonviolent strategy. Without it, you had nothing. Step number three in this strategy was Americans of conscience, in the name of decency, demand federal intervention and legislation. Now, who are these Americans of conscience? Yeah, they call themselves liberals. Humphreys? Uh-huh. Oh, Kennedy? You know, Javits, those guys. See, when the violence occurred, they come up and say, we must do something that the violence has occurred because, because uh, the Negro don't have this right or don't have that right. We must pass this legislation. Uh-huh. And by that time, the American people are so frightened by the coming violence that step number four is ready for them. Step number four is the administration passes the legislation. So... That, my friends, was nonviolence. A technique employed, it's the same technique employed in Czechoslovakia, as a matter of fact, for those who want to study it. A technique whereby the Negro people were used to ram this legislation down our throats, which of course was supposed to help Negroes. Now the best way to understand the legislation is to look at it in terms of what I call 50% rabbit sausage. Nobody ever heard of rabbit sausage, but the Russians did. At the end of the Second World War, they were selling, uh, this is how the story goes, they were selling to the Poles something they called 50% rabbit sausage. They made it by mixing together one rabbit and one horse. Okay? Well, now, the rabbit part, of course, is the part we supposedly aided Negroes. The other part, the bulk of it, was legislation which simply increased the power of the federal government. In other words, the idea is to introduce more government and more government and more government and more government and more government until you have total government. Establish the establishment in hippie language. Make it bigger and stronger and protest against it all the time. This is the technique being used. This is what King was about. Now, once they had the knowledge out of King, as much as they could, let me digress here for a moment to bring in the second half of the revolution. The second half is supposed to be, of course, the white people joining with the Negroes, the so-called white workers. Well, the way they got in, using Negroes as a smoke scheme, was in 1960 or 1961, after SNCC was organized, of course, the founders of SNCC, I mean, the guys who were in there, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second, but the, the SNCC was organized, and then, with the demonstration, the white people, they're ready to get the white kids in. Now, I want you all to think back to 1961. You remember, the, 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 the King was had the demonstrations, you know, the sit-ins and all that stuff? And then all of a sudden, one day, you look at your television set, and there was a demonstration, maybe 50 people, maybe 100 people, a civil rights demonstration, nonetheless. They were sitting down or lying in the streets or standing lock, arms locked across the doorway, and you looked at that thing, and there wasn't a Negro in the bunch. Who were those people? Who were they? Yeah, they belonged to the SDS. That's who they were. Now, they got a lot of white kids who wanted to help Negroes. See, the white kids on the campuses looked at the Negroes in the terrible fight, and they said, we didn't know that. we got to help them. And, of course, those SDSers on the campus who knew what they were doing, it was called the Student League for Industrial Democracy at that time. See? They changed the name in 62 to disguise it. Just for purely for purposes of, uh, of deception. Well, these SBSs on the campus went around whispering in the kids' ears, we've got to do something for the Negroes, we've got to do it. I ought to know I was in that. I wasn't in the student league with us for democracy. I was in college when they were doing it. I know exactly how they did it. Told the white kids, you've got to help Negroes, you know, we've got to demonstrate, we've got to help them. It's injustice and all that. And the dingy white kids went out there in the street, believing they were helping Negroes, and got in that movement. Well, I attended a meeting in 1961, May 1961, called the New Left, at which the plans were discussed, whereby the white kids were to be transformed into something called an anti-Vietnam war movement.
of all worries tonight should be, not that we might consciously make the wrong decision, but that we might lose the decision simply by default, through ignorance and gullibility and apathy and fear. Our decision will determine not only the kind of world our descendants are going to live in, it may determine which they will have for an ideal and a taskmaster, hatred or love. The ultimate question we must face in our solemn meditations and decide by our actions may hold the outlook and the fate of mankind through uncounted generations. We must decide, or it will surely be decided without us, 